Praise the Lord and welcome to today's edition of our series of daily broadcasts which we have tagged the State of the Union. The State of the Union. That is the union between Jesus and his bride, the church. And so welcome again. Now, in the last couple of days, and now weeks, actually, we have been looking at the business of the Father, the one who says, tell my people to return to me. The business about which we have been since inception, looking at different areas different dimensions, different possibilities as to why God would need to send out a message saying, tell my people to return to me. Now, like I said, in the last couple of days, which have now evolved into two weeks, we have been looking at the business of the dimension of expression that was in Christ, which Christ noted by himself to have been the expression of the Father. He said, the words that you hear me say, they are the Father in me, the Father who dwells in me, that is doing the works. That is to say, that which was manifest in the person of Jesus, the Christ, was a revelation of the works of God. God the Father was the one walking in the man, Jesus, to produce all those effects which are now recorded in the scriptures as if to say, Jesus did this and Jesus did that. Jesus himself made that clear that it was the Father in him that was operating. The big question is, can we say the same of ourselves? Do we know enough of the Father in us do we recognize the Father enough to be able to say that whatever you see me do, it is the Father in me that doeth the works? Or rather, we imagine that the expectation is that we do certain things, especially as it looks like the scripture is written like that. That is, we are to do the doing. I agree. But the issue is, let us look at the example so that we can understand the dynamics of this business of Christianity. The apostle said, I am crucified in Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who died, who loved me and died for me. In other words, the apostle recognized that there was something else that was working in him. In another place, he said, Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. So there is a dimension of expression which the apostle understood which he reported as yet not I. Jesus similarly alluded to that dimension of expression when he said, I can of my own self do nothing. John 5 verse 30. In other words, the things that you see about me I'm not just doing them by myself. 
He said, I've not come to seek my own will, I've come to seek the Father's will. Therefore, as I hear, I judge. And then he clarified in John 14, 10, that the works that you see, they are the Father in me operating. Now, I did say a couple of days ago that in seeking this clarification so that we can return to the dimension of oppression of the Father in us, rather than seeking to go it ourselves, I did say that I wouldn't be surprised if somebody said to me, but the Bible says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That was about three, three days ago. Our broadcast of about three days ago. So if you are joining for the first time, you may want to avail yourself of that recorded version. I think it will be recorded as part one. Return to the dimension of expression of the Father, the grace of God, part one. So in that part one, I did make reference to the fact that I expect somebody to say to me, but the Bible says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Well, it has happened. It has happened. And that has inspired today's broadcast, which is to say or to reiterate Tell my people to return to me. The me being God in Christ. If Christ himself said that it is the Father operating in me, why do we think that it will be any different with us? And with the early apostles, it wasn't. Mark 16, 20. The Bible tells us 19 and 20 to be precise, that after Jesus had finished speaking with them, he was taken up into the clouds and he went into heaven and sat on the right hand side of God. But in verse 20, it says, and they went about preaching, every, preaching the word everywhere. And the Lord went with them, or walked with them, confirming their word with signs following. In other words, although the apostles were the ones seen going from place to place preaching, the real worker was the unseen factor called the Lord. And we generally understand that to be, although Jesus was sitting in heaven, he went with them doing the work, just as his father went with him doing the work. Now, we need to understand the difference so that we can come into rest in much of what we struggle at in the name of trying to live the life of the Christian. Remember, we died and we were raised to newness of life. That newness of life is in Christ. And in Christ is the Father. So necessarily, in Christ, it is the Father who is in us. So whatever you are going to try to want to be or to do has to take its bearing from the one that is now in you. So let us attempt a rehash or a recap of the things which we have said previously. Number one, it was God the Father that was walking in Christ the Son. At least Christ himself said that. The scripture also says that, specifically in Acts chapter 2, verse 22, that God was the one walking in Christ to produce all those miracles, signs, and wonders. Then in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19, it says that God was in Christ 
reconciling the whole world to himself. God was in Christ. God existed in Christ to do this job. So if God was the one who did all those things, God the Father did all those things in Christ, and Christ is our example, and we are in him, necessarily, God the Father would be the one operating in us in Christ. I think that's clear enough. The problem is, we read the scriptures, we understand the script, the letter of the scripture, and then we want to run with the letter of the scripture because we want to fulfill what the scripture says. And this is what we have been saying. That mentality is the mentality that produces burdens and unnecessary expectations. Why? The work belongs to God himself to do. So when you start trying to do what the letter of the scripture says, the same letter of the scripture says that the letter kill it, but the spirit brings life. In other words, if you seek to follow the letter, you are going to end up trying to do it yourself, and you are going to get exhausted, which is it kills. But if you operate by the spirit, which is of the Father, then life will comfort. Okay, let's look at some scripture. Remember, we are putting forth a simple expression of the mind of God. He says, tell my people to return to me. Return to me, and by implication, how I do things. Return to me, and by implication, to the example I already set forth in the scriptures. Now, what was that example? What was that example? Let us go back to the scriptures. Now, we'll start with Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, and verse 13. Because, to be honest, if we read verse 12 without verse 13, there's going to be a problem. But if we read the two together, then it should be clear. It says from verse 12, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now here is the problematic word. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Can we pause a minute? It says work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Let us take those words as they stand. Can you really work out your salvation? That means you have to go to the cross all over again. Because the work of our salvation was concluded at the cross. And we were nowhere near the cross when it happened. I dare say, unless you are 2,000 years old, then just maybe you climbed the cross with Jesus. But Romans chapter 6 says that the moment we came to Jesus, we actually climbed the cross with him and died on the cross. So the real working out of our salvation was done in Christ. But look at the next verse, verse 13. He says, for it is God which works in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. In this case, what is his good pleasure? To work out your salvation. But then he cautions that it is God who is working in you both to will to do it and then to actually do it. It is God who is working in you. So if we set aside the God factor and try to work it out ourselves, 
people are going to run into a problem. So this is the element of tell my people to return to me. Return to the dimension where in verse 13 it says, for it is God which works in you. The problem is we have been working it out by ourselves. And we are struggling and it's not working evidently. All right. Now that's the, that's the situation. That's what God is asking us to return to, to the dimension where he is the one who is working out our salvation. And he gave us his spirit to help us in that regard, among other things. Hebrews chapter 9, I'll read it from verse 11, although it's really verse 14 that we should be interested in. But Hebrews chapter 9, reading from verse 11, it says, But Christ, being come an high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, that he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. In other words, done deal. But that's verse 12. Verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an ifa sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. Now here's verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? What purges our conscience? The blood of Christ. What or how does it say that Christ offered himself without spot to God? This is the bone of contention. This is the point of return to me. He says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, to purge our conscience from dead works, what have we been doing? Trying to purge our conscience from dead works by ourselves. Through rigors of religion. He says, Jesus did it. That is, Jesus carried out his own assignment through the eternal spirit. Jesus didn't just go to the cross because he knew the Father wanted him to go to the cross. He went to the cross through the eternal spirit. Now that's the point of return to me. Get back to how I did it in Christ because that's the way I want it done. So although he says work out your salvation, with fear and trembling. It still has to be through the eternal spirit. The original working out of our salvation by Christ Jesus was done through the eternal spirit. Why do you think whatever you are going to do now is going to be by yourself? It's still going to be through the eternal spirit. And the eternal spirit is what? The spirit of the Father himself. Okay, it seems I'm getting excited. So let me calm down. Let's look at John chapter 15. Let's see what Jesus has to say about this matter of getting it right. Of getting it right, which we are referring to now as return to the dimension of the Father where he works it out himself in the spirit of grace, the grace of God. John chapter 15, we read it from verse number one. And it says, Jesus speaking, by the way, I am the true vine, and my father is the husband man. Every branch in me that beareth not, forth, that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean 
through the word which I have spoken unto you. Some of us think that we are clean because we've had a bath. Or some of us think we are clean because we have gone through certain rigors, like fasting, for example. Like abstention, abstinence from this and that. We think that that's what sanctifies us. That's what makes us clean. He says, you are clean through the word that I have spoken unto you. So we are not going to attain any degree of sanctification that is what it sought in the face of God minus his word. Because we are clean through the word that he has spoken to us. Now in verse 4 he says, and I think here is the crux of the matter. He says, abide in me and I in you. I don't need to read any further. What does the word abide mean? It is just, just a reference to, to stay or to dwell. It means a present continuous experience. Jesus put it in a different way in another place. He said, continue in me. Continue in my word. He says, abide. That is, have your existence in me and I in you. So how can we attain to anything before the Father? Minus this seven words in John chapter 15 verse 4. Abide in me. Have your existence in me. And I in you. Not you in you. And then he goes on. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except you abide in me. And then he nails it in the very next verse. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. For without me, you can do nothing. Without the dimension of the expression of God, in that God is the one walking in us to will and to do, he says, we are nothing. And then Jesus gives the caveat. Or if you like, the word of caution. Or if you like, the warning. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. That is to say, if your experience is not rooted in me, then you are nothing. And you are going to be that branch that will be cast forth. Let's look at, let's try to understand it from the life of a tree and its branches, just like Jesus did in this brief exhortation. Now, for the sake of this, this, this discourse, imagine a tree. We all know a tree. It has many branches, leaves, and of course fruit. Can the branches of their own produce fruit if they are separate from the tree? Of course not. Can the tree itself do anything if it were severed from the roots? Certainly not, unless it happens to be planted somewhere. And like Job said, or like he said in Job, that at the smell of water, it starts to sprout. Except that. So Jesus is trying to tell us something. So long as your existence derives from the root and therefore through the trunk and then the branches, and out to produce fruit. He said, except that that's the formula you are operating by, you are nothing. 
So God says, return to this formula. Be reconnected to the source of life. Because the life that is to be expressed in the name of Christianity has to be the life that is causing through us to be expressed out of us. And that life is able to express itself through us if we will simply cooperate. He says, without me you can do nothing. And if you don't abide in me, if you don't have your expression of life or, or existence, being in me, it says you are cast forth as a branch. Now, I really didn't mean to go into all that. But because I did say by myself that I expect that this series would be misunderstood in the light of work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It has happened. So I seek to clarify. Let's get back to the example that was in Jesus and which he transmitted to his apostles. Don't create something else because that's how you understand the letter of scripture. Because the same scriptures themselves clearly put it as the life of God expressed in the tree. Oh, sorry, the life from the roots expressed in the tree. And Jesus used the very same, uh, what do you call it? Analogy, thank you. He used the very same analogy of a tree to explain the point. Have your existence in me. He said, that's how you are going to be relevant. You try to do it yourself, you are going to be cast off. So God says, tell my people to return to me. Not just returning to him by way of, um, we have become backsliding. Yes, of course, but not just that. We have missed it in so many different ways. And God is calling us back. God is calling us back. Now, imagine the time when that's in the time of Martin Luther. I'm going to close with this. My time is really up. Imagine the time of Martin Luther. I mean, the, the main Martin Luther, not the one who, who lived in our, in our time. Martin Luther King, that is. The way I understand the story, about his time, they were building what is now known as St. Peter's Basilica. Well, or whatever they were building, the Pope had, had commissioned one of his cardinals to be in charge of building that thing. And the fellow came up with a brilliant idea of how to raise money. And the Pope agreed to these things. And so people began to give money for the salvation of their loved ones who were already dead. And then quietly, God says to Martin Luther, I think from Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, the just shall live by faith. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In other words, if you are not operating by my word, you are dead. He said, the just shall have life or have a living by by his faith. And faith, minus the word of God, is nothing at all. Something else. And so, incensed at what was going on in his local church, Martin Luther wrote what we now understand as the 95 years as his thesis for which he was excommunicated. Now, this is how it has always been. From time to time, God raises a voice. John the Baptist was such a voice. Malachi was such a voice. Elijah was such a voice. Isaiah. All over time he has raised people to get his people back to the original design. Back to the original design. The original design is in Christ. 
and in Christ is God the Father working it out. That is what we were left with. That's what the apostles understood when they say, yet not I, but the grace of God that lives in me, or the grace of God that was with me, and the grace of God as we understand it came by Jesus. And in Jesus was the Father. Let's get back to the dimension of understanding where it is God the Father in us, through Christ, that is being expressed in the life that we understand. And not to understand the business of Christianity as we understand life generally. No, sir. No, ma'am. It's not the same thing. But I close with this one word. Thus say the Lord, tell my people to return to me. I'll see you again. And if the Lord pleases, we'll take this up some more tomorrow. Otherwise, we we'll go on to something else. In the name of Jesus, tell my people to return to me. Let's get back to how God designed it originally. That's the only way the church can become what she ought to be, what she once was, but which she must become. Praise the Lord.